Now it is my distinct pleasure to bring you Professor Stephen Cotter and his daughter Leah Cotter to talk about his grandmother and her great grandmother. And I'm not going to bore you with some of the mundane details of Professor Carter's bio, but I will tell you the things that intrigued me about the professor. Um, he was raised in a family that was committed to public service. And it struck me that his mother worked as an executive director for Julian Bond, someone I believe to be one of the greatest orators of our time. His father was an attorney who became an administrator and later a president of Cornell University. Professor Carter, in addition to teaching, finds time to do an awful lot of writing and has done it since high school when he was the editor in chief in his high school in Ithaca of The Tattler. Um, but since that time, he's published 15 books, six novels, um, and, and it goes on. Um, when I approached Professor Carter and his daughter about doing this program, which as I said, was on, on Juneteenth, um, they immediately agreed. And, and that's a testament to their commitment to the importance of civic education um, and civics in itself, which Judge, Judge Carter deals with in his book, Civility. Um, I actually met the Carters in November of 2018 when I attended a program where they spoke at the New York Public Library. And I was struck by some of the parallels in the, with the Carter's family and my own, even though my, my parents were immigrants. Um, but I spoke to them, I stayed after the program, and there was so much of the book that, that intrigued me and came to life for me that I, I decided it was not something that I could let go of. And as I said, um, after Judge Gary asked me the questions that she did and I thought about it, it seemed to me that it would be a perfect book to bring to my attorneys and counsel's office. And then I, as I thought more of it, I said, that the book was too important and Professor Carter was too important and Leia was too important to only have 23 people hear, hear him speak. And I thought, how could we really get this program out to a larger audience? And so I'm really thrilled today that with the help of the Historical Society and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, um, that we were really able to bring this program together. And I give you now, Professor well, let me give you Leia first, because Leia and I had a very interesting conversation a week or so ago. Um, and as, as I said, there are so many things about the book that intrigued me, um, one of which is that Eunice Carter lived on Decatur Street, and so did my parents, and so did my grandmother. Um, and oddly enough, um, when Addie and William, Eunice's parents, were traveling, Eunice and her brother Adolphus were left in the care of the Hastrums. But so, so were we. And so I think there's a connection to the Hestrom family that lived on Decatur Street. Um, Leah's a year, and that's how actually I, I came to, to know Leah better, because Leah, because I went up to her and I said, I really want you to want to drill down and figure out how we have this connection to the Hestroms. And, and Leah said to me, well, here's my email. We can be in touch. And so we did stay in touch. Um, Leah is a Yale grad. She has an undergraduate degree from Dartmouth where my ex-husband taught. Um, she told me that she wanted to get her PhD in philosophy. That was her undergraduate major. And that um, her thought was that she'd become a professor after she got her JD. Um, she'd get a PhD in philosophy. Um, she's since come away from that, but did what most people do after law school. She joined Paul Weiss. Um, and I think knew from the beginning that that was not gonna be her career path. Um, and so after four years of practice and casting about for something to do, she said she was visiting with her parents and her father said he was learning so much about his grandmother and his great and his, his grandparents that he didn't know about, his great grandparents. Um, and she said, well, why not help? Why, why shouldn't I help with the research? And so she did. And she related a very poignant story to me of sitting in the Howard University Library and um, reading a letter written by her great-great-grandfather, William Carter, where he's writing to a friend of his um, and looking over his life. 
and she said that the story, the letter was written so beautifully that she really started to cry and she she realized that she was really coming to know her great great grandparents through archival work and she talked about how much she loved it. Um, and so I think there's another career path for you there, Leah. And with that, I give you Professor Stephen Carter and Leah Carter. Well, uh, first of all, let me uh, thank uh, Eileen Millett for uh, the idea and Judge Weber and the others who've also spoken. Thank you all for this invitation. Uh, and thank you all also uh, for being here and wanting to hear about uh, Eunice's remarkable story. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the Office of Inclusion, the Franklin Williams Commission, the Historical Society of the Courts, um, and especially to Eileen. Thank you for you know, having this idea, for putting this all together and reaching out to me about it. And yeah, thanks to everyone who's agreed to participate today. Um, I think Eunice would always be, she would be proud to know that she's getting this attention and that people are talking about her accomplishments. I, uh, I, I should explain uh, two things. Uh, one is that, that Leah and I settled on a tag team format. So you're gonna see us going back and forth uh, a little bit as we try to at least hit some of the highlights of, of is that Eunice is quite remarkable uh, story. Um, but I also want to say at the beginning, uh, I, I want to make clear that although my name is on the front of the book, it's a book that would not have been anything like what it is without not only uh, Leah's fantastic research, she went to archives all over the place, uh, but also without her ideas, her commitment to the story, and her own interest in it um, uh, uh, as well. And so I'm grateful uh, for that. Uh, and we're going to start really with the part of the story that, for lack of a better term, makes it most newsworthy, and that's the Luciano trial. That is to say, how did a black woman in 1936 in New York come to be one of the team of prosecutors involved in bringing to justice the most powerful mafia leader uh, in the country? And I'm going to hit only a few highlights of of the story since we don't have time, of course, uh, to uh, to tell it all. And then we'll talk more about who uh, Eunice was, where she came from, and we'll also end up by drawing some lessons, perhaps, at least lessons that we draw. Others may draw other lessons as well uh, from her work. You have to go back to uh, the 1930s uh, in New York. Uh, at this time, New York was basically uh, seen as a fixed city, which is to say that the mob had its tentacles everywhere, uh, took tribute from pretty much everywhere, uh, and operated with impunity because there were so many corrupt officials, uh, so many corrupt cops, everyone uh, was either uh, on the take or paying tribute, at least so it seemed. There were a lot of civic reformers, uh, in the newspapers and elsewhere constantly calling for an investigation of the mob. Uh, that didn't happen for a long time, in part because the uh, New York District Attorney at the time was a man named William Copeland Dodge, who was himself, uh, we now know, uh, on the take. Uh, and therefore, though he occasionally would prosecute a small mob figure, he never was interested in uh, taking on anyone larger than that. The other thing you have to know about New York at the time is that for all of the money that the mob made, and the mob, when we say the mob, we didn't think of the mafia, but actually there were a number of different ethnic gangs which worked together uh, to think of as, as the mob. They were not by any means all Italian American uh, gangs. There were a number of, of different groups working together, including black gangs as well. And that's significant because by far the most lucrative mob territory in the country at the time was Harlem. Uh, the mob, by most accounts, made more money in Harlem than in the rest of New York, all the boroughs combined. And most of that money in New York, in, in Harlem, some was protection money, some was loan sharking, but the bulk of it was from the numbers game, also known back then as policy banking and a variety of other things as well, the illegal gambling on the numbers. 
that was run for the rest of the mobsters largely by a man named Dutch Schultz, although the newspapers at the time uh, mistakenly thought that Dutch, Dutch Schultz was actually running the mob, he was actually running Harlem uh, for the mob. So anyway, reformers were clamoring for an investigation of the mob, the mob was too powerful and so on. So under pressure, William Copeland, the corrupt DA, uh, impaneled the grand jury and said we're going to investigate the mob. The trouble was that all he ever brought to the grand jury were very, very low-level mobsters, no one with any authority or power. So finally, literally, the grand jurors kicked the DA's office out of the room, refused to hear any more cases brought by the DA, and complained to the judge that the DA was not taking this seriously. Now, you might think that at that moment, a prosecutor would simply impanel a new grand jury, but, at, but there wasn't time for that because by the time Dodge might have gotten around to that, the governor, Governor Lehman, had gotten interested, and the head of the grand jury met with the governor, told him what was going on, violated grand jury secrecy to tell the governor what was happening, and the governor said to, uh, to Dodge, the DA, that you have to appoint a special prosecutor. It has to be one of the people from my list. It's not someone you're going to pick. There were some shenanigans around that, but in the end, the pro special prosecutor who was appointed, of course, uh, was Thomas Dewey. And Thomas Dewey, as part of his appointment, was promised, among other things, uh, his own staff, his own budget, even his own offices, so that he took offices in the Woolworth building and spent money completely redoing them to cover the windows and, and put in all these interior barriers and so on, so one person wouldn't know what was going on in the next office. And he proceeded to hire a group of 20 lawyers to go after organized crime in New York, who the press quickly dubbed 20 against the underworld. He hired 19 white men and one black woman. That black woman was Eunice Carter. And what's interesting is the newspapers at the time gave much bigger play to Negro woman, as they said, being hired than to anyone else. In fact, she was the only one of the assistants who got her photograph in the New York Times and the Herald Tribune, which at the time was the second biggest newspaper uh, in New York. They both put, a, both put a photograph on page three. It was a big deal uh, that she was hired, but then it came time for Dewey to divide up the responsibilities. And he had these very assistants. This one was going to look at loan sharking. This one was going to look at crimes involving organized labor. This one was going to look at drug dealing. This one was going to look at murder. This one was going to look at the numbers game and so on and so on and so on. Eunice was assigned to look into prostitution. And I mentioned that because prostitution was one of the things that Dewey made absolutely clear from the beginning. He had no interest in prosecuting. He said, I'm not here to prosecute people for vice. I'm here to prosecute, he said, real crimes. Not only did Eunice get assigned to prosecution, which was the traditional work of women prosecutors at the time, she also got assigned the smallest office at the end of a long hallway furthest from Dewey himself. It was plain that not much was expected of her. But over time, rather, she was the sort, this is the way that she was, if they give you lemons, make lemonade. Hey. If prosecution was what she was going to handle, then she was going to handle it right. And over time, through carefully and with discipline and perseverance, gathering evidence, interviewing, I won't go into all the details, they're in the book, she put together a case that prostitution in New York was not, as everyone thought, a, a group of independent contractors, but instead was run by something called the Combination, which paid tribute to Luciano. The reason that mattered was that if you could show that in court, then Luciano would be guilty of conspiracy, even if he never touched the prostitution business himself. Dewey was skeptical, not only because he didn't believe that prostitution had any kind of central apparatus, but also because, again, he didn't want to be a vice prosecutor. He wanted to get, to get uh, Luciano on something bigger than that. And by the way, as a footnote, why is he going after Luciano uh, instead of going after Dutch Schultz, who had been running the mob in Harlem? 
Uh, the answer was because by then Luciano had killed Dutch Schultz, as he tended to kill people who were in his way uh, in his climb uh, to the top. But in the end, unable to make a case on anything else, somewhat reluctantly, based on the, the evidence gathered by Eunice, Dewey agreed to indict Luciano on prostitution charges and did so. And Luciano fled to New York, he fled to Arkansas, he hid out in Hart Springs, eventually was arrested and brought back. Then it came time to try the case. So here you have Eunice, who's been working on nothing else, who has done all the interviews, the, all the interviews with members of the public who have seen prostitution, all the interviews of the women who are prepared to uh, accuse uh, Luciano himself in order to create that link necessary for the conspiracy statute. She's outlined all this. She's written it up in enormous detail. Naturally, she'll be one of the prosecutors who tries the case, except that she isn't. The prosecutor is Dewey, and he chooses three or four, depending on the day, white males uh, to work with him on the case, none of which had originally been involved in the investigation of prostitution, but all of, all of whom were involved in the other crimes. Well, all right, again, Eunice's view, lemons, lemonade. She works hard on the trial behind the scenes. She works hard preparing the witnesses, particularly the women, because the women are the only link between Luciano and prostitution. So their testimony has to be persuasive. Moreover, this is at a time, remember, when it was quite likely that members of the jury would be skeptical of them because of how they earned their living. So she's in charge of, of preparing them. She's in charge of, of creating the trial memos for the rest of the staff. She's also in charge of housing them, which is to say arranging housing that will be places where they can stay and then be guarded by the police as to avoid, so to avoid intimidation. There are 68 prosecution witnesses in the trial. Um, only four implicate Luciano. One we didn't deal with was not, I think, believable. The other three are all among these women, and Luciano's lawyer goes after them very, very hard. Uh, one of them, in fact, uh, a woman who amused the newspapers, a woman named, named Cope Flo Brown, uh, showed up for court apparently in withdrawal. She was a heroin addict. And several times during her testimony, this true story, the trial judge, Judge McCook, allowed her to take a shot of brandy on the witness stand in order to calm her nerves. Eventually, the defense objected that she was currently, in her testimony in the courtroom, under the influence of heroin. Uh, and so a doctor was summoned. And, and Koki Flo was taken to another room where the only lawyer in the room, there's no defense lawyer, the only lawyer in the room was Eunice because she was the only female lawyer in the courtroom uh, that day. So she observed the doctor's examination and the doctor concluded that in fact, uh, Koki Flo was not under, under the influence. Uh, there were some other issues that arose at the trial uh, that could have implicated Eunice in certain ways, particularly and it, it, some allegations that one of the witnesses had been allowed to go out and drink in the evening during the time she was supposed to be sequestered. Eunice was not alleged to be with her, but sequestering was Eunice's uh, job. But the uh, witness who made that claim uh, later went to work for the mob and was almost certain he was a police officer later went to work for the mob. And, and so there's reason to think his, his testimony was probably uh, fabricated. Now, the trial lasted a number of weeks, and in the end, Luciano was convicted. And he was convicted on this theory that was created by this black woman and no one had ever heard of just a few months earlier. And Dewey, to his credit, on the day the verdict was handed down, he said, I want to thank my assistants, especially Eunice Carter, who came up with this theory and developed this evidence. And before I hand it over to Leah, I, I want to mention one more story about this time. There's one story about this time that, as we mentioned in the book, is actually apocryphal. Uh, there's a story that, well, well some, when the, the plaque honoring Eunice was uh, dedicated, uh, 
several years ago, the plaque in the New York DA's office, I went down there. Um, a number of us from the family um, uh, were there. And the story was told at the time that because of threats from the mob, Eunice had sent her only son, Lyle, my father, Leah's uh, grandfather, uh, to Barbados to protect him from the mob. And that story actually is repeated in a number of histories of the trial. The only problem is it isn't true, uh, that she'd sent her son to Barbados six months before she was ever hired by Dewey, before Dewey had even been appointed as a special prosecutor, uh, she sent it there. Uh, nevertheless, it's a good story and I like it. Uh, one other thing, the question that always arises is why did Dewey hire her? Why did he hire a woman at all? Why did he hire a black person at all? Why this particular black woman? Different sources give different answers. And the files, at least the ones that we were able to see, uh, don't give an answer to that. In fact, there is a personnel file uh, of, of Eunice's that is empty, except for one piece of paper that has nothing to do with any of these uh, uh, issues. That's in the uh, New York Attorney Archives. Um, but there are a couple of different stories. Uh, whatever the story is, uh, there is some reason to think that there was pressure on Dewey to hire at least one black lawyer because the investigation was expected to uh, involve Harlem and, uh, and, and that the idea was to avoid the implication this was 20 white people investigating Harlem. And somehow, I guess the view is if you have 19 white people and one black person, it would make a difference. But that was what was in the newspapers. Dewey said later it was simply because she was excellent. Uh, Dewey said that he interviewed her and she simply uh, overwhelmed him uh, in the interview. And this matters because there were 6,000 applicants, 6,000 applicants for the 20 positions uh, for which Dewey was hiring. The lines stretched out the door of Dewey's office and literally around the block of people come to do all the interviews uh, himself. Uh, and his answer was, I hired her because uh, she was strongly recommended by a judge whom he knew. He didn't say who the judge was and they had the interview and uh, she simply uh, blew him away. So who was this uh, the, the, this Eunice uh, Carter, this this black woman who, uh, who blew Dewey away in the interview, who came up with the theory uh, and stuck to it uh, on which uh, Lucky Luciano was convicted, the only crime Luciano was ever uh, uh, convicted of. Uh, and for that, um, uh, we're going to turn it over to, uh, uh, to Leah. Thank you. Um, so Eunice's work on the Luciano trial really comes from the map and um, it's, as my dad said, the thing that's sort of considered most newsworthy today. Um, but it was really only a small part of her remarkable legal career. Uh, one of the things I find very inspiring about Eunice is that even though she was a brilliant attorney, her career wasn't a shooting star of success from the very beginning. Uh, she had a lot of disappointments, a lot of starts and stops. And in fact, law wasn't even her first career. When she graduated from Smith College in 1921, uh, she received a, both a bachelor's and a master's degree in social work. And in fact, she was only the second woman in the history of the college to receive both degrees in four years. After college, she did some teaching and social work, and she also wrote fiction. And she actually received some acclaim for her writing. Um, in 1924, she married Lyle Carter, a prominent dentist. Um, and in the fall of 1925, she gave birth to my grandfather, Lyle Jr. And that same fall, she was inducted into the prestigious Harlem Renaissance organization, the Writers Guild, at the same time uh, as Zora Neale Hurston, who is another one of my personal heroes. And this could have been Eunice's life. She could have stuck with her writing and, you know, maybe become a serious writer. Um, she could have kept doing her social work and really devoted herself to that. Or she could have settled very comfortably into life as a wife and a mother in Harlem society. She came from a very distinguished family and um, I think she was well positioned to enter Harlem society. Uh, or she was always part of Harlem society. She was always very social, but she, you know, could have, that could have been her entire life. Um, but she didn't choose any of them. Instead, when she was 28, she made the decision to attend law school. Um, and at the time that Eunice started at Fordham University School of Law, um, although a handful of black lawyers had been admitted to practice in New York, 
the New York Bar Association had yet to admit a single black member. And at the time, Catholic law schools like Fordham were making an effort to educate students that other law schools were working hard to keep out, specifically uh, women, black students, Jewish, and Catholic, and working class students. And one of the ways that Fordham expanded access to legal education was by allowing students to take classes at night, which Eunice did while still practicing social work during the day. She started law school in 1927, but she didn't finish her studies within three years. She withdrew in 1928, apparently due to health issues, um, and returned in 1930, and ultimately graduated in 1932. Um, and she then had to take the bar exam twice before she passed it. In 1933, she opened a small private practice, and while she had some high-profile cases, she did struggle a bit to find clients. Um, so she started to get involved in local politics. Um, she was a lifelong Republican, um, as her parents had been Republicans, and uh, many Black people were at the time. Um, and she ran unsuccessfully for state assembly in 1934. Uh, in 1935, she was appointed by Mayor LaGuardia to the Commission on Conditions in Harlem, which was assembled in response to the Harlem riot of 1935 to examine the causes behind the riot. And her position on the commission afforded her some notoriety in New York. And after this exposure, she was hired as one of Dewey's 20 against the underworld. And after the Luciano trial, which we've just heard about, uh, Eunice continued working for Dewey. She really saw Dewey, I think, as a mentor. And when he became Manhattan DA in 1938, she was made a deputy excuse me, a deputy assistant district attorney. And this was very acceptable, exceptional. At the time in the United States, there were very few, there were few black prosecutors, very few female prosecutors, and almost no black female prosecutors in the country. Uh, her salary at the time was $5,500 a year, which was a lot at the time and made her one of the most highly paid, paid black lawyers in the country. But many of her white colleagues at her same level were being paid more than she was. She was initially assigned uh, to the Women's Courts and the Abandonment Bureau, which are described in the book as dim graveyards where the careers of female prosecutors went to die. So despite her you know, incredibly important work on the Luciano case, she still wasn't given the sort of exalted position in the DA's office that we might have thought she would get. Um, but she performed her work excellently and enthusiastically. And she was soon made head of Special Sessions, which is the busiest bureau in the district attorney's office. And she supervised several white male attorneys and had a white assistant, uh, which the papers, the black papers at the time loved this. Um, and she tried many high profile cases, cases when she was running special sessions. And during her time at the EDA's office, she also founded a special program for the prosecution and rehabilitation of teenage offenders. In this way, uh, she was somewhat ahead of her time. And another way that she was ahead of her time was on the issue of sexual harassment, which was not a widely discussed idea at the time. During a 1937 speech to Howard University Alumni Club, she talked about the changing role of women in the workplace, especially black women. And she said, quote, there are men who exact from women a personal relationship of a rather intimate nature in order that women may feel secure in their jobs. Boiling in oil is just a little too good for those kind of men. Um, well, Eunice was at the DA's office. She also supported Dewey in um, unsuccessful bids for governorship and presidency. When he, and, and finally his successful bid for governor, when he ran for president, he actually ran on a very progressive civil rights platform. And he bragged on the campaign trail uh, that he had a black woman running the largest bureau in his office. When he became governor of New York in 1942, he took some members of the, of the, he took some employees from the DA's office to Albany with him, and Eunice was not one of them. And we don't know exactly why that is. Um, she was also not on the short list of people who Dewey suggested to run the office. And in the end, uh, he was replaced by Frank Hogan, who was three years younger than Eunice. Um, and when Honus, Hogan took over, he moved Eunice from special sections to the special part for adolescent offenders. This was a program Eunice had created, and I'm sure she was very proud of it and happy to work there, but she was no longer in charge of a field, full bureau. Um, and after, and under Hogan, uh, Eunice didn't try any more high profile cases um, or get promoted. And so eventually uh, in 1945, she feeling, after feeling sidelined within the DA's office, um, she reinvented herself again uh, by moving, by leaving the DA's office and 
moving into international work, which is what she devoted the rest of her life to. Uh, she attended the San Francisco Conference that the United Nations was founded and later served as the National Council of Negro Women's Accredited Observer to the United Nations and a consultant to UNESCO. She also argued before the United States Senate in favor of the Genocide Convention after World War II. And unfortunately, she never achieved her greatest ambition, which was to become a judge, uh, but she still had an incredibly impressive career. Now, going back to Eunice's initial decision to become a lawyer, we don't know exactly why she chose to do this. Um, my dad and I have discussed several possible reasons, but there's one story from her childhood that I think shed some light on the issue. Eunice was born in Atlanta in 1899. Her parents were William Hunton and Addie Waits Hunton, um, who were both prominent activists who have fascinating stories of their own. And I would encourage anyone who hasn't read the book to read it, just if only to read their stories, which are <laughs> really great. Um, William and Addie had planned to raise their family in Atlanta, but in 1906, when Eunice was seven and her younger brother Alpheus was three, uh, the Atlanta race riot broke out. A mob of white citizens swarmed through Atlanta's black neighborhoods intent on destroying black businesses and harming black citizens. In the aftermath, many of Atlanta's black citizens fled, including the Hauntons, who moved to Brooklyn. We don't know how Eunice experienced the riots or what she remembered about that time. We do know that the family was home. Um, a white family nearby had offered to shelter them and they, um, like a lot of their other families, had chosen to stay and defend their home, um, possibly armed. We don't know if they were, but it's, uh, a lot of black families would have been armed at the time, specifically for situations like this. Um, as it turned out, they didn't end up needing to use violence. Um, family legend holds that a white mob that came to the Hunton's neighborhood stopped just one house away from them on their street. Um, so the year after the Huntons moved north, they took a vacation to the Jersey Shore where Eunice met a little boy on the beach. And while they were playing together, she told him, while possibly still thinking in her mind of the noise and violence and fire of the Atlanta riots, that when she grew up, she wanted to be a lawyer because she wanted to make sure the bad guys went to prison. And that is what she ultimately became famous for doing. Uh, we thought that we would close uh, just by offering a couple of quick reflections on lessons that we at least would draw from, um, uh, from Eunice's life, although others might draw other reflections. I wanted to mention very, very briefly one particular scene from her life. Leah mentioned a moment ago that Eunice's greatest dream was to become a judge and that she never became a judge. And then the question is, why not? She had other dreams. She thought, for example, that she might be in Dewey's cabinet and she wasn't when he was uh, governor and so on. But the judge was the thing she really wanted. Now, why, why didn't she become a judge? Well, there are a lot of reasons. First of all, no matter how good you are, uh, there's always a lot of really good people who want to be judged and maybe you just didn't, you weren't one to fill out of the mix. We could say, well, it was race, or it was gender, or it was race and gender, but there were black judges, there were women judges at the time, and during her yearning to be a judge, we saw two black women judges appointed uh, in New York. So what else was it? Whatever the reason, the real reason was, Eunice thought she knew the answer. She blamed her brother. Eunice's brother, Alpheus Hunton, who I think was mentioned briefly earlier, um, was a communist. And I don't mean he was someone who was accused of communism. I mean, he was a dyed in the wool, I love Stalin communist, as a lot of black radicals of the day were. And in the early 1950s, when the leaders of the US Communist Party were indicted basically for the crime of being the leaders of the US Communist Party, uh, Alpheus was one of three trustees of a fund that was set up to supply their bail, to raise bail for them. There were 11 leaders uh, and uh, they were tried. They were freed on bail. They were convicted. They were freed on bail pending sentence. Eleven, seven of them showed up for sentencing. Four of them fled. Uh, so the trial judge uh, called in the trustees of the bail fund and demanded to know the names of the people who had contributed to the bail fund of the theory, maybe that's who's hiding them. And the trustees refused to say who the, uh, to, to say who the, 
people were who'd contributed. Uh, and so they were sent to prison. They were sent to prison for refusing to give up those names. Uh, one of the trustees was Dashiell Hammett, the famous writer who was a good friend of Alpheus's. One of them was uh, Frederick Vanderbilt Field, uh, who was the inheritor of two of the great American fortunes, although he was cut off by the family after he went to jail. And the third was Alpheus Hunton. Uh, uh, Field and Hammett were sent to a relatively low key federal prison in the Midwest to do their time. Alpheus Hunton was sent to do hard time at a segregated uh, prison in Virginia. Um, now, during all of this, Eunice was practicing law. She had a legal practice, she had a lot of experience, she'd been a prosecutor, she'd done some defense work, but she never got involved in this case. From what we can tell, she never offered and Alpheus never asked. The truth is by this time they were estranged. She believed that Alpheus's hardline communism was the reason that she didn't advance as much as she, uh, as far as she wanted to in a lot of things in life, and particularly uh, in the contest, as it were, to become a federal judge. Now, the lesson from all this, the one I want to mention, there's two actually. Uh, one is that it's really bad to be estranged from people for that kind of reason. Their political reasons were very sharp. There's no question. They were sharp. They were real. They were in issues of importance, but they were also brother and sister, and perhaps they should have found some sort of modus vivendi. Uh, the other issue, the other point, though, is that there is something very troubling even now about the idea of punishing people for their political views. Uh, and, and it's easy to forget the extent to which laws in effect against having certain views have been used again and again to stifle radical instincts in the black community. And this is a good example of it. I think that my own very strong commitment to free speech and very strong opposition to punishing people for their ideas stems from the stories I heard growing up about Alpheus Hunt and the way this man who had uh, a PhD from NYU, his undergraduate degree was from Howard, his master's was from Harvard, he was one of the great experts on uh, Tennyson and the Victorians. He couldn't find a job after that. He worked in, in a factory because he couldn't get a job in any kind of academic institution. And, and for me, one of the big lessons of Eunice's life, in a sense, comes from her brother's life. And it's the sense that we really oughtn't to be in the business, I believe at least, of, of punishing people because they hold very strong views, uh, even when they're views that we disagree with or find, uh, or find dangerous. And I think Leah has some, some closing also. Yes, um, so my personal lesson from the book, this sounds corny, but uh, I really think- corny. Learning about Eunice was, uh, it taught me a lot about perseverance. Um, personal perseverance and what I could call, I guess, political perseverance. Um, she, as we've heard, had a lot of setbacks in her life. Uh, when she, you know, she didn't pass the bar exam the first time, she got the job in Dewey's office, but then she was given the terrible assignment in the little office at the end of the hall. Um, and she never gave up. She never gave up on herself. Um, and she, I think, I think Eunice always felt, had a sense of what she deserved, um, that she deserved recognition, that she deserved reward for her hard work. And, um, and that, I think, kept her going when, at times when she could have just, you know, sort of put her head down and gone, okay, I guess this is what it is. Um, but she always kept going. And I think also uh, political perseverance in the sense of, you know, her whole family had to deal with, you know, just things that are, really difficult, well, somewhat difficult to imagine um, today. And um, they never gave up. Her parents were both activists. Her mother used to um, go travel around the South by herself on behalf of the double NAACP just to visit local NAACP chapters in uh, towns that were being terrorized by the Ku Klux Klan to sort of reassure the chapters that the national organization hadn't forgotten about them. and. You know, they kept going. 
her parents kept going, Eunice kept going, her brother kept going um, after everything she went through. And I just um, found that really inspiring and a useful lesson uh, for so many situations. So this is, a, this is really a question for, for either Professor Carter or Eunice. Um, uh, you, you talked about Eunice. Or Leah. Le Leah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Leah, you talked about <laughs> Eunice being um, inducted into the Harlem Writers Guild with one of my favorite writers, Zora Neale Hurston. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what she wrote about? Um, so actually, I think my dad, is he has more uh, experience with reading her writing than I do. He either, either one of you. Can you tell yeah. us about what she wrote about? I'm, I'm to say something about it. Two, two quick things to answer that. First, there have been a series of organizations that are called the Harlem Writers Guild. Uh, and this is the original one. There's a Harlem Writers Guild today. These are not, these series that have been up for them are not connected to each other. They keep arising and dying and hope the current one will survive. But the original Harlem Writers Guild was limited to about a dozen um, uh, writers and all of the big uh, writers of the Harlem Renaissance uh, remembers. Um, Eunice uh, wrote short stories and she wrote book reviews. Um, and some of her book reviews were really, really scathing. Um, there's a, a book uh, review of hers, of Wallace Thurman's uh, The Black or the Berry, which is in some anthologies to this day. It's just a, a, a almost vicious de destruction, deconstruction uh, of, of the book. But mostly she wrote short stories. I think she published seven or eight uh, short stories. Some of them were somewhat autobiographical. Um, one is about some, a brief time she spent teaching um, in Louisiana uh, after college. Uh, one is about is simply about a black woman looking out the window at the Harlem streets and watching as the curfew falls. That is the time that bars elsewhere in the city and clubs elsewhere in the city are required to close, watching all the white people come up to Harlem. Uh, watching their window as they all come up and then they they go back and just it's the whole story's reflections on this. Her writing was really quite beautiful. My own view is that the stories, like anyone's, are of uneven quality. Most of them are really are, are, are really quite good, and some of them, are particularly a story she writes about taking a walk deep into a southern wood and discovering what's going on there, I think is a spectacular uh, uh, short story. But they were mainly short stories, and they were mainly uh, autobiographical. I think that she had about said seven or eight published short stories and four or five published book reviews, but I, I'm not sure of the number of book reviews. I'm pretty sure of the number of stories. Thank you. Um, so Leah, you told us earlier about her travails in the DA's office um, following the, the, the trial um, uh, of Lucky Luciano. And, and we know that Jane Bolin was the first black female judge in New York City. We're curious as to whether or not your grandmother, great-grandmother, would have come before her in any cases. Um, that is a good question. I'm not, oh, it might have happened. Um, she argued a lot of cases. I don't, I'm not aware of any, um, but I think it's certainly possible. Yeah, I, I think Leah's right. We we did try. We searched various databases for plate cases that she'd argued. We did find some, but none involving um, um, Jane Boleyn. And I think that when Jane Boleyn was appointed, if I remember correctly, um, that was in the early 1940s. I'm like, I, I think is that right? And I, I think by that time. Um, she was uh, no longer trying cases, I believe. I, 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 I think that's what we ended up, but I, I honestly don't remember that, that detail of the research, but I, but I think that's what we found out. Um, Professor Carter, you've talked a lot about the, um, what I guess one would dub the Harlem Renaissance, because it was really a time of a lot of uh, foment and thought, and uh, a lot of um, very interesting people who lived together. So we, got, we have, actually have a comment from someone in our audience um, asking whether you are aware of the fact that Eunice Carter, James Weldon Johnson, Paul, and Eslin Robeson were all neighbors on Jumel Terrace, directly across from the Jumel Mansion. <laughs> yeah, um, so I, I did uh, kind of know that in the following sense. Uh, so, so Jumel Terrace uh, was a segregated street 
all white until Eunice and her husband bought a house there, uh, number 10 Jamel Terrace, in the uh, late, mid to late 1940s. I don't remember the exact uh, date. So that, at that time became one black family. And then um, I don't remember uh, when James Earl Johnson did, but Paul Robeson, as I recall, uh, bought in 1951, I believe 50 or 51. And actually Robeson wrote a wonderful essay that's just about the view from his front window uh, on Jamel Terrace, which I have to quote um, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in the book. I might add that um, Eunice, spent a lot, Eunice and husband spent a lot of money renovating Jamel Terrace. There's a place they had all these fabulous, uh, I mean, the, number 10 Jamel Terrace, and it was, they had held all these fabulous uh, parties uh, and, um, uh, and, and so on. But after her husband died in the late, early 60s, uh, she sold the house and moved to a smaller apartment on uh, Central Park West. There is a connection to the Huttons and the Hutton and Williams law firm. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. And, um, I just wondered whether you'd ever done anything with that. <laughs> Other people have asked us the same uh, question. Without going too deep into the weeds, uh, there's there's a historian. So so, so Eunice's so so Eunice's is, is my grandmother and Leah's great grandmother. Her father is William Hunton, Hunton, born in Canada. William Hunton's father is Stanton Hunton, who was born enslaved in Virginia as Staunton Hunton in probably 1809, maybe 1808, but probably 1809 he was born. Now, there is some, the historical record is unclear as to exactly how he came into Staunton Hunton came into the possession of Thomas Hunton, uh, who owned him for a time and left him to his, his wife. Nevertheless, uh, there, is, there is a historian who says uh, that, that Thomas Hunton's brother, William, was Stanton Hunton's actual father. And if that's true, that matters because it was Thomas Hunton's, I, I'm sorry, it was William Hunton's great grandson I'm sorry, grandson. It was William Hunton's grandson who founded Hunton and Williams. So if uh, indeed William Hunton was his father, then they're like second cousins or something. Uh, I don't remember. We calculated the degree of, of relation. We put it in, in the book. I, I, the reason I say that with a grain of salt is that uh, our research suggests that William Hunton probably wasn't Stanton's father, that his father was probably a man named Gustavus Horner, uh, who um, who would have been his father and would have had relations with his mother, whose name was Betty. Uh, and since a relationship between a person and another person owned his property, it's fair to describe it as rape. Um, and that's probably, we don't know for sure, the other historian could be right, but that's probably Stanton Hunton's uh, uh, father. Uh, and if that's the case, then he's, it was no relation to William Hunton. He just got the Hunton name when he was eventually sold, still as a child, into the Hunton uh, family. So it's possible. I just want to say it's possible that it's the same family as, as the one that founded um, Hunton and Williams. We just don't know that for sure. Or, I should say we know that he was owned by the family. We don't know if the family's blood was in his veins. That's what I'm trying to say. Leah, you were about to say something. Oh, just that we joke that we should get reparations from Hunton and Williams. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we should write them a letter. I'll write one this afternoon. Write them a strongly worded letter. So really early in Eunice's life, um, Addie decides to take herself off to Germany. And and uh, is it she, she enrolls at, at the Kaiser Wilhelm University and the children go to a German, a private German language school. So were you aware Professor Carter, of your of your grandmother speaking German uh, later on in her life, or can you tell us anything about that? Oh dear. Well, I I, I, I need to try to give you a, a, a short answer, but Leah can also talk about that time time in history at least if she wants to. So you have to understand the stuff in this book. When I was growing up, I didn't know any of it. I want to make that very clear. I knew vaguely that my grandmother had been a lawyer. I knew that her brother had been in prison, and that was 
about it. All I knew was that she was this incredibly stern woman. She terrified us. She was always correcting our grammar and our table manners and so on. We were so scared of her. Only through working through this project did I come to understand, in effect, why she was the way she was, not only because of things she'd been through, especially when she was younger, but also because to work her way up through the New York legal establishment, to work her way through the cases that she tried and worked on, the other things she did in life, she had to develop a very tough, intimidating exterior, or she would have, wouldn't have made it. That was the way you avoided in those days, I think, getting crushed if you were black in particular, if you were a black woman. So I came to understand her uh, better, but I didn't know she spoke German. Um, and until I worked in this book, I never understood why my father, I knew my father spoke German, um, but I never knew why he spoke German. I mean, I mean, he spoke it a lot, but he did study it in college and he spoke German words sometimes and spoke just German now and then, but I never knew why that was. And it had just hadn't made the connection that it was because his mother had sp had spoken German, had learned to speak German. Actually, was apparently quite uh, fluent in German during this time that she had been studying abroad, that her mother had been studying abroad. One other interesting note about the book, and I, it's a point that you, Professor Carter, and you, Leah, make. Um, it says something about the fabric of of the woman, your 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 grandmother and your great grandmother. Um, in 1989. They lived in a 12-room house in Atlanta that was staffed by a cook, a maid, and a man to tend the furnace and the garden. Um, that couldn't have been your typical life for many people of color. <laughs> well, maybe not. And again, Leah might want to speak to this also. But, but Eunice always emphasized, she always said their house was very modest. Um, they lived in a neighborhood the, of, of Atlanta where there were a number of black um, families who were middle class. The cost of labor was extremely low. A lot of people had hired help of, of various kinds, but they were not a wealthy family by Atlanta terms or by black Atlanta terms or anything like it. They were a middle class family. There were some very wealthy black families who lived in the area. Uh, but their home uh, and circumstances were quite modest by comparison with a lot of others um, uh, in, uh, uh, in the area. Yeah, um, I think this is always one of the really fascinating things about studying a lot of different historical periods is how cheap labor used to be and how many people would have, you know, uh, hired help who didn't appear to be that wealthy. Um, but one thing about them is uh, one thing I realized going through uh, William Hunton's letters, uh, which also included a few letters from Addie Hunton, um, they were often very strapped for cash. There were a lot of times when Addie was writing to Jesse Moreland, who was William's best friend, um, basically asking him for money, just asking him for some money to get through you know, the next few weeks or whatever. Um, so yeah, they not only were their lives modest, there were times when uh, they were, yeah, pretty direish straight. Well, I, I think we're coming, unless I, there are other questions from the audience. Ah, uh, well, one question, quick question before we, we turn this over to um, to Judge Weber. Um, and I, before that, I will introduce um, the Dean of Fordham Law School to say a few words. We have a question from the audience asking if Eunice Carter had a good relationship with the other 19 lawyers in the office, and did they accept her work as being important? Um, that is a reasonable question. Uh, based on the records, we can say that she had a good relation. I think Leah will agree with us with some of them. Um, so, for example, uh, she worked closely with Murray Gerfine, uh, later a very distinguished um, uh, federal judge. Uh, the two of them ended up working together to organize the materials uh, for the uh, prostitution case. And there were some other lawyers to whom also came to respect her um, uh, over time, uh, in, in fact, there's a there's a story um, uh, in the book uh, in which she and another lawyer, obviously a white male lawyer from the office, are in a bar, uh, not a bar, but a club in Harlem, and uh, and and somebody basically comes over to them and and offers them what can only be termed as a bribe, 
Uh, uh, so she clearly had good relations uh, with some of them, but the people who were most tightly around Dewey, if you look at the records, at least that exist, their paper records with her were simply very officious. Do this, don't do that. Usually little scribbled notes in the corners of other, uh, other memos. Uh, the lawyers who were up and down her hallway, uh, who were well, upper hallway, she's at the end of the hallway. The lawyers further up her, her hallway seemed to be the ones with whom she was, uh, uh, she was closest. I don't know, Lee, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I was just going to say we know that she was close with a few people. Um, I don't think we, I don't think we had any evidence of like, you know, sort of any kind of general, like of them treating her particularly badly. Um, that other, aside from the fact that she, you know, didn't get a very good assignment at the beginning, and it was hard for her to get Dewey's attention. Um, like even when she came up with the theory about uh, prostitution, it took her a long time to get it to Dewey's attention. Um, but yeah, I don't think we have any, I don't know if you remember anything, Dad, but anything about her having bad relations with anyone or being treated particularly No, bad. it's just that last point I'm glad you made, which I'd forgotten, which is there was a shield of people around Dewey whom she had to get through, basically, when she would send memos up the chain of command, and usually nothing would happen. Memos about prostitution, about this theory and that theory, and nothing would happen, and nothing would happen. Constantly, repeatedly, nothing would happen. She wouldn't even get a meeting I was doing to discuss them. That took a long time. That took from, she was hired in August. And apparently her first meeting to discuss prostitution with Dewey, as opposed to occasionally something on another case, was in January. Uh, so you can see how hard it was actually for her to get through that screen of senior people whose job was to essentially, in their mind, I think, keep Dewey focused on, let's not do prostitution, let's do something else. Fascinating woman, fascinating life, fascinating history. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Professor Carter, that you won't be able to stay with us for the panel um, as we continue I apologize on for the that. program. Oh, we, we well understand you have a busy schedule. Um, Leah, thank you so very much.